thank you very much, uh, Christophe, for your presentation. It is for me uh, a real pleasure uh, to be here this evening, and I would like to, first of all, uh, thank to the Freiheit Berke, uh, to the Students for Liberty, to the Hayek Gesellschaft for organizing this whole uh, event. When I was coming, I saw uh, this uh, statement of Karl Marx at, at the main entrance, advising us uh, as philosophers not only to interpret the world, but also to try to change it. And uh, this is that w which I will try, what I will try to do this evening, to explain in which way the Austrian approach provides a unique and different uh, interpretation of the world, and also provides a way to change uh, the situation toward a, a better world, a good and a better world, not like the evil and wrong world that Karl Marx advised. Well, so I, I am going to divide my presentation on the essence, the essence, uh, das Wissen, the essence of the Austrian school in three parts. In the first one, uh, I will try to explain uh, where are the roots of Austrian economics, because I have been uh, defending since the last two decades that the roots of Austrian economics should be uh, found uh, precisely in my country, uh, in Spain. Secondly, I, I will try to summarize the essence eh, of the Austrian school, especially the main differences between the Austrian approach and the mainstream approach that is normally taught at uh, the universities, different universities. And finally, lastly, but not least, le but not least I will try to uh, uh, introduce a new concept of economic efficiency, the concept of dynamic efficiency, it's an alternative, the Austrian alternative, to the traditional concept, static concept of Parettian efficiency. And uh, I will try to explain where are the relations between, and which are the rela relations between ethics and, uh, and economic theory, precisely through this concept of dynamic uh, efficiency. So let us begin making uh, a few points on what I think are uh, or is the true origin of the Austrian School of Economics, which uh, we should trace back to the books and works of uh, the Spanish scholastics of the what we call Siglo de Oro Español, the Spanish Golden uh, Century, which uh, ran be between the middle of the 16th century uh, till the middle of the 17th century. The great Austrian scholar, Morai Rothbard, uh, probably is the first one who developed uh, this thesis precisely in uh, this very important conference that was established, was uh, organized in South Royalton in 1974, and in a way marks the beginning, the revival of the Austrian school last century. And uh, this uh, thesis was also developed formerly by Friedrich August von Hayek, that uh, follow Bruno Leoni in, in, in the idea that the origin of the, of the theory of the free market should be looked for in Spain, thanks to the works of the Spanish Dominicans and Jesuits, and not in uh, the United Kingdom, not in uh, Scotland. I have here a letter uh, signed by Hajek and dated January 7, 1979, in which Hayek writes that Rothbard, and I quote, I will read it, well, it is written in English, that Rothbard demonstrates that the basic principles of the theory of the competitive market were worked out by the Spanish scholastics of the 16th century, and that economic liberalism was not designed by the Calvinists, but by the Spanish Jesuits. Yeah. And Hayek concludes the letter, I underline it in yellow, it's the last statement, saying, I can assure you from my personal knowledge of the sources that Rothbard's case is extremely strong. Yeah. This is the end of Hayek's quotation. So, who were these Spanish scholastics? These ancestors of the modern free market movement. Most of them were scholastics teaching morals and theology at the University City of Salamanca, 
I don't know if you've been, any of you have been in Salamanca. This is a wonderful Spanish medieval city located 150 miles to the northwest of Madrid, very close to the border of my country with Portugal. These scholastics were mainly either Dominicans or Jesuits. And as we are going to, to see right now, they were able to articulate the subjectivist, dynamic, and libertarian tradition, which 250 years later was to be stressed by Karl Menger and his followers of the Austrian school of free market economics. Let us recall some of their contributions that uh, you can study with more detail in the German version of my book uh, entitled The Austrian School that has been distributed to all of you. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the first author to be mentioned should be Diego de Covarrubias y Leiva. This is his name. Covarrubias was born in 1512. He was the son, the son of a very famous architect in Spain, and he became bishop of the city of Segovia. I recommend you, if you go to Madrid, to go to Segovia, especially to see his tomb in the cathedral, and to eat uh, suckling pig, which is a, specialist, a specialty eh, of Segovia. But I have distributed also to all of you this DVD, which is a, a presentation I gave uh, at the Cathedral of Segovia, precisely on November the 8th, last year, on the Scholastics. And I, it is the English version. Probably we will prefer a German uh, version too. Diego de Covarrubias also became a minister of the government of uh, the king, uh, Philip uh, II. And if you go to Spain also, I recommend you to uh, go to the museum of the great Spanish painter El Greco. Uh, this is important because we are precisely now uh, celebrating the 400th anniversary of El Greco in the city of uh, Toledo. And then in this museum, you, you will see a stunning portrait of Covarrubias who in 1554, he established better than anyone before him the subjectivist theory of value, which is, as you know, the foundation of all free market principles. Specifically, Covarrubias concludes, and I will quote him, this is the English translation of his uh, book in Latin, he concludes that, and I quote, the value of an article does not depend on its essential nature, but on the subjective estimation of men. And he adds, even if that estimation is foolish. Hmm? And he concludes that in the Indies, in America, wheat is dearer than in Spain. It's more expensive than in Spain because men subjectively esteem it more highly, though the objective nature of the wheat is the same in both places. I think this is a very important lesson that for instance, Karl Marx should have read. Hmm? <laughs> Another important author of the Spanish scholastics is Luis Sarabia de la Calle. Uh, this was the, the first uh, uh, thinker to demonstrate that prices determine costs and not vice versa. Another lesson for Karl Marx. Sarabia de la Calle also has the special merit of having written his main work in Spanish, not in Latin. The title of his book is Instrucción de Mercaderes. In English, we would say instruction to merchants or instructions to entrepreneurs. Hmm? What they could do or they shouldn't do hmm? in order not to commit any sins. And then we read, in this book, we read the following, and I will quote now. He says, those who measure the just price by the labor, costs, and risk incurred by the person who deals in the merchandise are greatly in error. The just price is found not by counting the cost, but by subjective common estimation." End of quote. And Sarabia de la Calle also is a great critic, critic of fractional reserve banking. <laughs> He maintains that receiving interest from a bank is incompatible with the nature of a demand deposit, in that in any case, a fee should be paid to the banker for the custody and safekeeping of the money entrusted by his, its client, clients to him. So 
A similar conclusion is uh, reached by another important Spanish scholastic, Martín de Azpilcueta. Martín de Azpilcueta is also known as Dr. Navarro, Dr. Navarrus in Latin, because he was born in Navarra. Navarra is the northeastern autonomous region of Spain, famous for the Encierros. Encierros is a festival, as you know, held in the region, capital city of Pamplona, where every July people run in front of the bulls at great risk of their lives. Eh? Apilcueta was born the year following the discovery of America in 1493. He lived to be 94 years old and is especially famous for explaining the quantity theory of money for the first time in 1556, when he analyzed the effects on Spanish prices of the massive inflow of precious metals, gold and silver, coming from America. The Spanish scholastics also gained a clear insight into the true nature of market prices and the impossibility of attaining an economic equilibrium. For instance, we have the Jesuit cardinal Juan de Lugo, Juan de Lugo, wondering what the equilibrium price could be or was, as early as 1643 reached the conclusion that the equilibrium depends on such a large number of specific circumstances that only God can know it. In Latin, he's, he stated, pretium justum mathematicum licet soli deo notum. I think that all my colleagues of economic theory, not only in this university, I would say worldwide, should read Juan de Salas uh, contributions, Juan de Lugo contributions. Because there is another cardinal, Jesuit cardinal, Juan de Salas, I just mentioned him, uh, that also uh, tried to see if uh, either a scholar or a governor could get the information that is uh, daily created anew by entrepreneurs in the market. And in 1617, he reached the conclusion that that information, that knowledge, is so complex that quas exacte comprendere et ponderare dei est nonominum. In English, that only God, not men, can understand it. Furthermore, the Spanish scholastics were the first to introduce the dynamic concept of competition. In Latin, they wrote concurrentia. This is the Latin name, concurrentia, for competition, which, according to them, should be understood as a process of rivalry among entrepreneurs. For instance, we have Jerónimo Castillo de Bobadilla, who wrote in 1547 the following, and I quote, prices will be driven down by the rivalry or rivalry. In Latin, he writes emulatio, emulatio, emulate, eh? rivalry, and competition, concurrentia among sellers. So he has a, an idea of competition like a, a process, dynamic process of rivalry among the entrepreneurs. So apart from, from these ideas, and like uh, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich von Hayek, and I would say most of the members of the Austrian school, maybe with the uh, exception of Wieser, who are naturally prone to be classical liberals, the subjectivist Spanish scholastics tended also to defend a strong libertarian positions in political matters. For instance, we have the great founder of international law, the Dominican Francisco de Vitoria, who began the Spanish scholastic tradition of denouncing the conquest and particularly the enslavement of the Indians by the Spaniards in the New World, thus reviving the idea that natural law is morally superior to the mere might of the, say, of the state, of the government. And this natural law tradition was further developed by the great libertarian Jesuit Juan de Mariana, who in his book on the alteration of money, the Monetae Mutatione in Latin, published in 1609, condemns as robbery 
any government debasement of coins, any act of inflation. Mariana also maintained in his well-known theory of tyrannies that any individual citizen can justly assassinate a governor, a king, who imposes, for instance, taxes without the people's consent. And he includes inflation as an example of a tax without people's consent. Or another example of a tyrant, according to Mariana, uh, the king that seizes the property of individuals and squanders it, or that prevents a meeting of a democratic parliament. Well, the only doctrine uh, on which I disagree with Mariana is his condemnation of the typical Spanish fiesta of bullfighting. But uh, being as I am the grandson of a famous Spanish bullfighter, I concede that I'm probably not too impartial on this matter. Now, let me remind you that in the 16th century, the emperor, the Kaiser, Charles V, who was also the king of Spain, Charles I, sent his brother, uh, Ferdinand I, to be king, well, or better, Archduke, Archduke of Austria. In those days, uh, the Spanish, the Austrian Spanish uh, uh, Empire comprised almost all of continental Europe, with the only exception of France. France was a kind of an island surrounded by Spanish forces. Now you will understand the, the origin of the intellectual influence the Spanish scholastic had on the Austrian school. And this was not a pure coincidence or a mere whim of history, but originated from the intimate historical, political, and cultural relations which arose beginning in the 1500s between Spain and Austria, and which would continue for several centuries. Italy also played a very important role in this connection, acting as an authentic cultural, economic, and financial bridge over which the relations between the two farthest points of the empire, in Spain and Germany and Austria, flowed. So as you see, there are very strong arguments to support the thesis that, at least at its roots, the Austrian school is truly a Spanish school. And I'm defending since uh, the last decade that we sh should change the name from the Austrian School of Economics to the Spanish School of Economics, from the, uh, the, school of the Vienna School to the Madrid School. Let us see if uh, I'm successful in changing the name of the, of the school. Well, indeed, I, I, I think that the greatest merit of the founder, the official founder of the Austrian school, Karl Menger, was to rediscover and take up this continental Catholic Mediterranean tradition of Spanish scholastic thought, which was almost forgotten and cut short due to the very negative influence of Dan Smith and his followers of the British classical school, including all the Americans, the Chicago school, and so on and so forth. To quote Professor Leland Yeager eh, in his uh, review of Rothbard's uh, uh, last book on the history of economic thought from the point of view of the Austrian school, Yeager, Leland Yeager uh, wrote the following. Adam Smith dropped earlier contributions about subjective value, entrepreneurship, an emphasis on real world markets and pricing, and replaced it all with a labor theory of value and a dominant fo focus on the long run natural price equilibrium, a world where entrepreneurship was assumed out of existence. He mixed up Calvinism with economics as in supporting usurary prohibition and distinguishing between productive and unproductive occupations. He lapsed from the laissez-faire of several 18th century French, Italian, and Spanish economists, introducing many waffles and qualifications. His work was unsystematic and plagued by contradictions. And even worse, he prepared the way to Karl Marx. Fortunately, and despite the overwhelming intellectual imperialism of the British classical school, the continental subjectivist 
Free market tradition was never totally forgotten. Several economists like Cantillon, Turgot, and Say kept the torch of subjectivism and entrepreneurial analysis burning. Even in Spain, and during the years of decline in the 18th and 19th centuries, the old scholastic tradition survived. And in spite of the typical inferiority complex toward the British and American intellectual world that we are still uh, suffering, suffering we we, he found proof of the uh, uh, marginal uh, uh, theory of value. He solved the paradox of value 27 years earlier uh, of the uh, um, Karl Menger uh, through uh, uh, another scholastic uh, of Catalonian origin. We, don't, we are not very sure if Catalonia is still or not part of Spain, but uh, Jaime Balmes is his, na his name was a, a Thomist a philosopher that was born in Catalonia. He always considered himself to be uh, a Spaniard. And during his short life, he became the most important Spanish Thomist philosopher. And in uh, September 7, 1844, he published an article entitled True Idea of Value or Thoughts on the Origin, Nature, and Variety of Prices, in which he solves the paradox of value and clearly develops the idea of marginal utility. Balmes asks himself the following. Why is a precious stone worth more than a piece of bread? And he answers, it is not difficult to explain since the value of a thing is determined by its utility. If the number of means of satisfying a need increases, the need for any one of them in particular decreases as it is possible to choose among many, none of them is indispensable. For this reason, a necessary relationship exists between an increase or decrease in value and the shortage or abundance of a thing. So in these ways, you see, Balmes was able to close the circle of the continental Catholic tradition of subjectivism, which could then be completed a few years later by Karl Menger and enhanced by his followers of the Austrian School of Economics. We can conclude then that to a large extent we owe to these great thinkers of the Spanish Golden Age the current revival of free market liberalism and of the Austrian School of Economics all over the world. And as you know, it is generally agreed that the 1871 publication of Principles of Economics by Karl Menger gave birth to the Austrian School of Economics. Menger's primary contributions are based then on Spanish scholastics and include the subjective theory of value, the discovery of the law of marginal utility, the theory of the spontaneous emergence of institutions, the conception of the production process as a series of successive temporal stages, and the criticism of historicism and the methodist stride against Smaller and the rest of the German socialists of the chair. Menger's most brilliant pupil was uh, from Eugene von Bembaberg, who developed even more these uh, contributions and applied them to both the theory of interest based on time preference and to the theory of capital capital understood as the estimated value in terms of free market prices of the specific capital goods which embody the intermediate stages in any production process. Moreover, von Baberg demolished the Marxist theory of exploitation, as well as Alfred Marshall's theory of price determination based on the objective cost of production. After von Baberg, we have Ludwig von Mises, who was the leading member, as you know, of the third generation of Austrian economists, and without a doubt, the most important member of all of them. Mises was responsible for the school's most vital practical contributions. Let us uh, remember them. First, the theory of the impossibility of socialism. And I've written a book on that matter, just published in German and translated by my colleague, Marius Kleinheyer, you have a copy here. The second contribution of Mises is the Austrian theory of economic cycles. And I've written another book on that matter, also published in German, that was mentioned by Wilhelm on 
titled Heldbankreditung Konjunkturzyklen, and translated into German by my colleague Philippe Bagus. The third contribution is the theory of entrepreneurship, or the idea of a, a dynamic market process. The fourth con contribution of Mises is the criticism of interventionism. And the fifth is the systematization of the Austrian methodology that was developed earlier by Karl Menger in the Methodenstreit. Mises also gave us the best known treatise on Austrian economics, human action, which has appeared in many editions in almost the most important languages in the world. For instance, only in Spain, we have published up to now 11 editions of human action, 10 editions in Spanish and one edition in Catalonian. <laughs> Mrs. Uh, most uh, well-known disciple was Friedrich August von Hayek. That is, he gives the name to our society, Gesellschaft, and who won the 1974 Nobel Prize in Economics. As you know, Hayek father developed all of Mises' contributions. He developed, demolished also Keynesian economic theory and was the key theorist of the spontaneous market order in the 20th century. Closer to our time, the chief Austrian economists have been Moray Rothbard, the author of over 20 books and hundreds of articles on theory and history, who provided also the driving force, the driving force behind the theory of anarcho-capitalism. And Israel Kisner, that uh, till his uh, retirement, uh, was a professor of economics at New York University, and who developed and refined the Austrian theory of entrepreneurship. And nowadays, I am particularly proud of the great development of the Austrian school all over the world, and especially in my own country, Spain, where, among other achievements, the first official master's degree on Austrian economics, directed and founded by me, was approved by the authorities, not only the Spanish authorities, but also the European authorities. Probably they didn't know what they were approving. They thought, <laughs> an Austrian master program, that's very good. So some Spanish studying the Austrian economy, let us approve it, you know, in order to improve the, the European spirit. So, and this, uh, well, this master degree program has been receiving around 40 or 50 students every year since the last eight years. We, we are reading an average of four, five doctoral theses uh, per year and half of the students come from outside uh, Spain and we are very willing and we, we would be very proud to receive any of you on this program and if it is possible to see the culmination of it with a doctoral thesis, which is exactly, precisely the career followed by my uh, most esteemed colleague, Professor Philippe Bagus, uh, who arrived eight years ago in my office. My secretary told me there is a young, very timid young German uh, a student, a scholar waiting for you. I asked him to pass. Uh, uh, who are you? I'm Philippe Bagus. What do you want from me? I want to study with you in order to become a doctor in economics and a specialist in Austrian economics and to become the, to become the best professor of Austrian economics worldwide, not only in Spain, but also in Germany. And they say, come in. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and so he developed his career in our university. It is a, uh, we are very proud of him. I think it's a, it's a luxury for the Spanish university to receive these young scholars from, from Germany. Uh, I'm very proud of it. And one of the good things of Europe is that we cannot discriminate against not uh, Spaniards. And now I am filling my university with uh, uh, scholars from outside Spain. Uh, and the leader of those uh, uh, scholars is, without any doubt, uh, Philippe uh, uh, Bagus. Now, let us proceed with the second part of my presentation, in which I will try to summarize the essence. What is the essence, the true essence of the Austrian school? Well, Mrs wrote a very fine statement eh, to describe the essence. He said the following, and I quote him, what distinguishes the Austrian school and will lend it immortal fame is precisely the fact that it created a theory of economic action and not of economic equilibrium or non-action. 
That's the key idea. So the, the neoclassical and mainstream paradigm that has prevailed thus far in economic is, is science and that this is now stagnating due to its highly unrealistic assumptions, its static nature, and its uh, formal reductionism is, is clearly in, in crisis. And now the, the focus of the Austrian uh, approach uh, reveals itself with all its uh, uniqueness. Hmm? Uh, it's, this, this approach is entirely different. The economists of the Austrian school concentrate their analysis on the dynamic processes of social cooperation which characterize the market. So they, or we devote close attention to the central role played in these processes by entrepreneurship and by the different institutions that make life in society possible. And I will define and uh, describe entrepreneurship with detail a little bit later. So the Austrian approach contrasts starkly with the economic analysis shared in different versions by neo-imposed Keynesians on the one hand and the Chicago School on the other. Keynesians hold that the economy is in a state of equilibrium with many market failures, while the Chicago theorists believe it is in a Pareto efficient state of equilibrium and thus free of market failures. So this is a very important idea because despite the ideological contradiction between these two versions of equilibrium analysis, Keynesians and the Chicago School, Austrians see in them the same total lack of understanding about the real working of the market. Because the market is an entrepreneurial process of creativity and coordination, a process which by definition can never reach any Pareto optimum. However, because the market fosters creativity and coordination, it is dynamically efficient as long as the following condition is met. Institutional state coercion in the form of interventionism or socialism must not hinder the free exercise of entrepreneurship nor make it difficult for any human being to freely reap the fruits of his creative action. And this condition requires full respect for private property, of course, within the framework of the rule of law, and a government of a strictly limited powers, or no government at all. One of the main contributions of the Austrian school has been the demonstration that it is impossible to organize our societies based on coercive commands and regulations, and socialist, a socialist and interventionist constantly attempt to do. The reason this cannot be done is because a planning agency cannot possibly obtain the first-hand market information necessary to achieve coordination with its commands. As I explain uh, with detail in my book, and you have seen that already thought the Spanish scholastics 400 years earlier. As a result of this insight, the Austrians economists were the only ones able to predict the collapse of the economies of the former Eastern Bloc, as well as the dead end crisis of the welfare state. And these predictions contrast sharply with the inability of general equilibrium theorists, like Samuelson, Dickinson, Oscar Lange, and others, to even perceive the insolvable economic calculation problem socialism poses. It is unsurprising that they failed to recognize the problem because in their models, they started from the assumption that all the information necessary to solve the corresponding system or simultaneous equation is already given, data, and available to the planner at all times. In short, the real problem which the spontaneous order of the market resolves each day in a context of continual change, creativity, and coordination is considered already solved from the very beginning in the mathematical models of general equilibrium theorists. However, they were not the only ones unable to fully grasp the Austrian challenge to the mainstream. Even the equilibrium theorists of the Chicago School, like Frank Knight, Milton Friedman, George Stickler, Harvey Rosen, Coase, also failed to grasp it. In fact, only 15 years ago, and I remember it very well because I was in the, there, at a Montpellier Society General Meeting held in Vienna, the late 
Chicago school economist Sherwin Rosen stated the following, and I quote him, the collapse of central planning in the past decade has come as a surprise to most of us, end of quote. And even Ronald Coase himself said the following words, nothing, I quote him, nothing I would read or known suggested to me that the collapse was going to occur. So this is a clear illustration of what I am trying to explain to you. Another important aspect of the contributions, the essential contributions of the Austrians is their theory of capital, money, I, and economic uh, cycles, uh, which I have developed in my book uh, already mentioned, translated into uh, German. This book, by the way, has been published up to now in 21 different languages, including Arabic, uh, Hindi, uh, well, Japanese, Chinese. The first one surprised by this success is myself. And it is not my merit. I think it is the merit of the, the Great Recession, because I, if not, I cannot explain uh, the reason of that. Eh? The, the content of the Austrian business cycle theory and also the content of my book could be summarized in this way. Let us see. In the banking system currently in force worldwide, under the supervision of central banks, in a contest of nationalized money and legal tender laws, bankers enjoy a privilege, the privilege of operating with a fractional reserve, already criticized by Luis Sarabia de la Calle 400 years ago. This privilege regularly leads to the expansionary granting of loans that are not backed by an actual increase in voluntary savings. The inexorable result of this credit expansion is the unsustainable lengthening of the processes of productive investment, which tend to become disproportionately capital intensive. A speculative bubble forms and give rise to a grave real error in capital goods investments. For instance, in Spain, we built one million homes eh, that nobody wanted. We were building 700,000 homes per year, the same amount as in, in the rest of the European Union together. And nobody thought this was going to create a problem. The intensification of this inflationary process through credit expansion will inexorably and spontaneously reverse. And this reversal will trigger an economic crisis or recession in which investment mistakes will be exposed. Unemployment, of course, will climb, and the need to liquidate and reallocate the resources invested in error will arise. So economic crises are not exogenous, as the Chicago School and Real Shocks theorists, like, for instance, Kidland and Prescott think, nor are they endogenous to the market economy as Keynesians and the other market failure theorists assert. Instead, economic cycles, according to the Austrians, stem from a problem of erroneous institutional design, the existence of a privileged fractional reserve banking system. And the solution lies in the following, the privatization of money, in a return to a rigid monetary system that humans cannot manipulate, like the classic gold standard, the establishment of a 100% reserve requirement on demand deposits, which at least since the great classical Roman jurists, and we have downstairs the statue of Theodor Mommsen to remember us. This is a principle, a general principle of law of property rights exactly the same as with any other deposit of a fungible good, such as wheat or oil. And finally, it would be needed to eliminate central banks, which in modern market economics are in fact the only socialist planning agencies that remain operative. Beginning with the European Central Bank. So it is not surprising that the only theorists to predict the Great Depression of 1929 were Austrians, namely Ludwig von Mises and Hayek. They foresaw it as a consequence of the monetary and financial excesses committed after the establish establishment of the United States Federal Reserve 100 years ago, in 1913, and especially during the Roaring Twenties. Incidentally, during those years, the 1920s, the 
the happy 20s, not only Keynes, but also the monetarists led by Irving Fisher, believed the economy had entered a new bonanza period that would never end. Austrian economists also predicted the stagflation which emerged after the incorrectly named oil crisis of 1973 that almost entirely destroyed the Keynesian theoretical analysis. Moreover, Austrians repeatedly warned about the credit bubble and the irrational exuberance characteristic of the again so-called new economy period, which began almost 20 years ago and which ended with the great recession of 2008 that we are still suffering. And on this matter, you can also see my Hayek Memorial Lecture that I delivered at the London School of Economics two years ago with the title Economic Recessions, Banking Reform and the Future of Capitalism that has been distributed to you. And Austrian economists also opposed to the typically Keynesian and monetarist anti-deflationist paranoia. I will name it anti-deflationist paranoia, currently so fashionable. Yeah. For Austrians, complete monetary stability, I would say even a zero rate of inflation, even a mild deflation, are not a threat but a blessing and are the, the ideal framework for any economy whenever it has its origin in a sustainable increase in exports and productivity, as, as is now happening following precisely the, the, the leadership of Germany in Spain, in Portugal, even in Greece and other European countries. Furthermore, a healthy deflation also disciplines even more politicians and unions. It increases the aggregate income of the formerly expropriated by inflation creditors and teaches everybody that the only way to competitiveness and productivity is to liberalize the economy, reducing public spending, taxes, and regulations. So I would say that this paranoia is the current, the most uh, important current mental illness affecting my colleagues and may also many politicians and social leaders. The development of the theory of entrepreneurship has been another of the main Austrian school contributions. Entrepreneurship refers to the human capacity to recognize the opportunities for subjective profit that arise in the environment and to act accordingly to take advantage of them. When people act in this way, when we human beings act in this way, we set in motion a creative process by which pre-existing maladjustments are discovered and coordinated. This process lies at the heart of the spontaneous order of the market, as Hayek and Kirchner have shown. And intimately related with the above idea is the dynamic concept of competition, understood as a process of rivalry, creativity, and discovery, in which entrepreneurs compete with each other to be the first ones to find and seize profit opportunities. And this concept is diametrically opposed to the mainstream and neoclassical model of perfect competition, in which, paradoxically, everyone does the same thing and sells at the same price. In other words, in the neoclassical mainstream model of perfect competition, nobody competes. And this neoclassical model, and this is important, especially in Germany and for other liberals, this neoclassical model is the heart of antitrust legislation that, according to Austrian economists, should be entirely abolished. Antitrust agencies do suffer exactly the same problems of lack of knowledge and impossibility of economic calculation of any other planning agency. And its intervention in the market is not only morally unjust, but also always dynamically inefficient. We should also note that Austrians criticize the unjustified application of the methodology used in natural sciences and physics to the field of economics, an error Hayek refers to as a scientism. The Austrian school has developed an a prioristic deductive methodology which correctly links the formal realm of theory with the empirical realm of history. 
And Austrians do reject the use of mathematics in economics, since mathematics is a formal language which has emerged in response to the demands of physics and formal logic. In these areas, constancy is assumed. The entrepreneurial creativity and the passage of subjective, non-specialized time are entirely absent. And this is precisely the main shortcoming of the so-called, now so fashionable, dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models that only provide a virtual and fake so-called evidence of what would happen in an unreal world populated by representative agents, like robots or penguins, but not by real human beings who are creative entrepreneurs. For the Austrians, only the verbal languages that human beings creatively evolve in the course of their daily entrepreneurial tasks provide a suitable vehicle for scientifically analyzing the realm of world facts that pertain to a spontaneous market process which are never in equilibrium. Another very important idea for the Austrian is regarding the future. Because for mainstream economists, the future is in, a, in some way there. It's like uh, a continuation of the past that can be studied with econometrical uh, uh, tools. But for Austrians, the, the future is not there and we are waiting to see it. The future is something that we must create a new every morning. So there is no way to know the future because it, is, it depends entirely in our entrepreneurial action, the entrepreneurial action that we will develop uh, in the future. For that reason, Austrian economists regard the prediction of specific economic events as the task of the entrepreneur and not of the economic scientist. At most, we economists can make only qualitative or theoretical predictions, pattern predictions, to use Hayek's terminology, concerning the discoordinating effects of economic interventionism in any of its forms. However, we as economists cannot make predictions which apply to precise circumstances of time and place. In short, for Austrians, the fundamental economic problem is not a technical one of how to maximize an objective constant and known function, for instance, subject to con constraints, known constraints, even if they are called dynamic constraints, which are also considered known and constants. On the contrary, the fundamental economic problem is strictly economic in the Austrian sense. It arises when many ends and means compete with each other, when knowledge about them is not given nor constant, but dispersed throughout the minds of countless real human beings who are constantly creating them anew. In this situation, one cannot know all of the existing possibilities and alternatives, much less those that will be created in the future, nor the relative intensity with which with each one will be desired. Therefore, it is not surprising that a growing number of prominent mainstream neoclassical economists, like for instance, I would mention the, the late Mark Blauk, have shown great courage and have ultimately declared their apostasy of, from the general equilibrium models and the neoclassical Keynesian synthesis. For instance, Bloch Mark Blauk uh, wrote before he passed away the following. I have come slowly and extremely reluctantly to view that they, the Austrian school, are right and that we have all been wrong. And more recently, for instance, Colander and others have concluded that, and I quote them, dynamic programming models have serious limitations. The researchers assume representative agents and rational expectations, which assume away any heterogeneity among economic actors. Such models presume that there is a single model of the economy, which is odd, given that even economists are divided in their views about the correct model of the economy." End of quote. And finally, and I would like to stress this point, because I think we have the enemy inside our family, Austrian theorists view the Chicago school's defense of the free market as particularly erroneous. 
For instance, when they defend monetary nationalism and flexible exchange rates against the traditional Austrian support for the gold standard, or at least a monetary union, or a system of fixed exchange rates, as I elaborate with detail in the movie, and also in the article uh, that I have published with the title In Defense of the Euro from the Austrian Point of View. A perfect market, and this is my attack, my criticism of the Chicago School, a perfect market in the neoclassical sense is a contradiction in terms. The market must be defended not because it is perfect or Pareto efficient, but because it is a process of discovery, creativity and coordination, which is never in equilibrium and cannot be improved, but only worsened through government regulations. regulations. And up to here, the second part of my presentation, and now I will proceed with the final part, the third part regarding the relation between the dynamic concept of efficient and ethics in economics. Well, the term, the word efficiency derives etymologically also from the Latin, from the Latin verb ex facio. Ex facio means to obtain something from. Eh? The application to economics of this concept of efficiency is the ability to obtain something from predates the Roman world and can even be traced back to ancient Greece, where the term economia or economia was, was first used to refer to the efficient management of the family home. The great, the great Xenophon, in his work on economics, which was written 380 years before Christ, explains that there are two different ways to increase the family estate. And each one is equivalent to a different concept of efficiency. The first corresponds with the static concept of efficiency and consists of the sound management of the available and given resources to prevent them from being wasted. According to Xenophon, the best way to achieve this static efficiency is by keeping the home, the family home, in good order. And this is his advice to the wives eh, of each family, to keep in good order the family home. However, Along with the concept of static efficiency, Xenophon introduces a different concept, that of, I would call, dynamic efficiency, which consists of the attempt to increase one's estate through entrepreneurial creativity, that is, by trade and speculation, more than by the effort to avoid wasting the resources already available. And this tradition of clearly distinguishing between the two different concepts of efficiency, the static and the dynamic, survived even until the Middle Ages. We have, for example, the case, the case of San Bernardin of Siena. San Bernardin of Siena in the 14th century, at the end of the 14th century, wrote that the profit of merchants, of merchants was justified not only by the sound management of their already given resources, but also mainly by the assumption of the risks and dangers. He wrote in, in Latin, pericula, perils, risks, dangers, which arise from the entrepreneurial speculation, and which is the foundation of the concept of dynamic efficiency. Unfortunately, the development of mechanical physics, which began with the modern age, had a very negative influence on the evolution of economic thought, especially after the 19th century, when the idea of dynamic efficiency was almost entirely forgotten in economics. Both the Austrian Hans Mayer, who succeeded uh, Bisser in his chair in Vienna before the Second World War, and also Philip Mirowski nowadays, have stressed that mainstream neoclassical economics developed as a pure copy of 19th century mechanical physics, using the same formal method, but replacing the concept of energy with that of utility and applying the same principles of conservation, maximization of the result, and minimization of waste. The author most representative of this very negative trend was Leon Balras, who, for instance, in his paper Economics and Mechanics, published in 1909, claimed that the mathematical formula of his book, 
elements of pure economics are identical to those of mathematical physics. Identical, he wrote. In short, the influence of mechanical physics eradicated the creative, a speculative and dynamic dimension which was implicit in the idea of economic efficiency from its very beginning. And all that remained after that was the, the reductionist, a static aspect which consists only on minimizing the waste of already known or given economic resources. And this change occurred despite the fact that neither the resources nor the technology are given in real life, but actually do change continually as a result of entrepreneurial creativity. This reductionist concept of static efficiency had an immense theoretical and practical influence in the 20th century. For instance, we have the Fabian socialists, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, that provide a very good example. This married couple were shocked by the waste they believe was produced in the capitalist system, and they founded the London School of Economics precisely in an effort to champion the socialist reform of capitalism. The object of such socialist reform would be to eliminate waste and make the economic system efficient. The Webbs later made no secret of their warm admiration for the efficiency they believed they observed in Soviet Russia, to the point that Beatrice even declared, and I quote, I fell in love with Soviet communism, end of quote. Another noted author to be strongly influenced by the aesthetic concept of economic efficiency was John Maynard Keynes himself, who in his introduction, you can read it in your own language, in his introduction to the 1936 German edition of his general theory, expressly states that his typically Keynesian economic policy proposals, and I quote, are more easily adapted to the conditions of a totalitarian state. End of quotes. Of course. <laughs> Keynes also highly praised the book Soviet Communism, was the title, which the Webbs had published three years earlier. Furthermore, in the 1920s and 1930s, the aesthetic concept of economic efficiency became the focal point for a whole new discipline, which came to be known as welfare economics, and which grew from a series of alternative approaches of which Pareto is the most well known. From a Paretian perspective, perspective as you all know, an economic system is in a state of efficiency as no one can be made better off without making someone else worse off. Our main criticism of traditional welfare economics is that it reduces the problem of economic efficiency to a simple technical problem of maximization, in which all the economic data are assumed to be given and constant. However, both assumptions are entirely wrong. The data are continually changing as a result of entrepreneurial creativity, as we know since 500 years ago at least. Precisely for that reason, we need to introduce a new concept, the concept of dynamic efficiency, understood as the capacity to foster both entrepreneurial creativity as well as coordination. In other words, dynamic efficiency consists of the entrepreneurial capacity to discover profit op opportunities as well as the capacity to coordinate any previous social maladjustments. In terms of neoclassical economics, the goal of dynamic efficiency should not be to move the system toward the production possibility frontier, but rather to enhance the entrepreneurial creativity and thus to continually shift the production possibility curve to the right. The word entrepreneurship derives etymologically also from the Latin, from the Latin term impreendo which means prendo, prendi, prensum, which means to discover, to see, to realize something. In this sense, we may define entrepreneurship as the typical human ability to recognize opportunities for subjective profit which appear in the environment and to act accordingly to take advantage of them. Entrepreneurship therefore involves a special alertness, which the Webster Dictionary defines as the ability to be watchful, vigilant, 
Also fully applicable to the idea of entrepreneurship is the verb to speculate, speculate, speculator, which comes from the Latin word specula, which refers to the towers from which lookouts could see in the distance to detect anything that was approaching. Now, from a dynamic standpoint, an individual, a company, a corporation, an institution, an entire economic system will be more efficient the more they promote entrepreneurial creativity and coordination. From this dynamic perspective, the truly important goal is not so much to prevent the waste of certain means considered known and given, as it is to continually discover and create new ends and means. And for a more extensive treatment of this entire very important matter, I would recommend you the principal works of Mrs. Hayek, Kirner, and Rothbard on the idea of the market as a dynamic process driven by entrepreneurship and on the notion of competition as a process of discovery and creativity. And I've written uh, recently a book published by Routledge in English with the title The Theory of Dynamic Efficiency. And currently, my colleague, my German colleague, Marius Kleinheyer, is doing a lot of effort in Cologne Translated, translating this book into German. That hopefully would, would be my fourth book published in this great country. So, in my opinion, these Austrian authors provide us with the most exact concept of dynamic efficiency, which contrasts with the more imperfect concept of dynamic efficiency developed by, for instance, Joseph Alois Schumpeter and Douglas, Douglas North. Let us talk a little bit about these two gentlemen. North and Schumpeter offer totally opposite perspectives. While Schumpeter exclusively considers the aspect of entrepreneurial creativity and its destructive power, which he, co he calls the process of creative destruction, Douglas North concentrates on the other aspect, which he calls adaptive efficiency, or the coordinating capacity of entrepreneurship. Now, we see that the true Austrian concept of dynamic efficiency that developed by Mises, Hayek, Kirchner, and so on, combines both the creative and coordinated dimensions, which Schumpeter and North study only in a separate, partial, and reductionist manner. And to finish, what is the relationship that exists between ethics and the concept of dynamic efficiency, which I have just presented? Mainstream neoclassical economic theory rests on the idea that information is objective and given, either in certain or probabilistic terms, I don't mind, and that the issues of utility maximization have absolutely no connection whatsoever with moral considerations. Furthermore, the dominant static viewpoint led almost to the conclusion that resources are in a sense given and known. And therefore, the economic problem of their distribution was deemed separate and distinct, different from the issue of their production. Granted, I, will, I would grant it. If resources are given, it is vitally important to inquire into the best way to allocate them among different people, both the available means of production and the consumer goods that result from the different production processes. But this whole approach collapses like a stack of cards if we follow the dynamic concept of market processes, the theory of entrepreneurship and the notion of dynamic efficiency I just have explained. From this perspective, every human being has a unique creative capacity that continually enables him to perceive and discover new profit opportunities. Entrepreneurship consists of the typically human ability to create and discover these new ends and means. And this is the most important characteristic of human nature. And if ends, means, and resources are not given, but are continually created from nothing as a result of the entrepreneurial action of human beings, clearly the fundamental ethical problem is no longer how to justly distribute what already exists, but instead how to promote entrepreneurial creativity and coordination. Consequently, in the field of social ethics, we arrive at the fundamental conclusion that the idea of human beings as creative and coordinating agents implies the axiomatic acceptance of the principle that every human being has a natural right to appropriate all the results of his entrepreneurial creativity. 
That is, the private appropriation of the results and fruits of entrepreneurial creation and discovery is a tenet of natural law. Because if an acting person were not able to claim what he creates or discovers, his capacity to detect profit opportunities would become entirely blocked, and his incentive to act would disappear. Moreover, the principle is universal in the sense that it can be applied to all people in all possible times and in all conceivable places and circumstances. To coerce free human action to any degree by impairing people's right to own what they entrepreneurially create is not only dynamically efficient, inefficient, since it obstructs their creativity and coordinating capacity, but also fundamentally immoral. See, since such coercion prevents human beings from developing that which is by nature their most essential nature, the most essential characteristic, their innate ability to create and conceive new ends and means and to act to attempt to achieve their own goals and objectives. Precisely for this reason, socialism, interventionism, and estatism are not only dynamically inefficient, but also ethically unjust. It must be taken into account, of course, that the force of entrepreneurial creativity also manifests itself in the desire to help poor people, and in the systematic search for situations in which others are in need in order to help them. In fact, coercive state intervention through the typical mechanism of the so-called welfare state neutralizes and to a great extent blocks the entrepreneurial effort to help one's neighbors, both close and distant, who are experiencing difficulties. And this is an idea that, for instance, Pope John Paul II stressed in section 49 of his 1991 encyclical Centesimus Annus. Furthermore, according to our analysis, nothing is more dynamically efficient than justice, understood in its proper sense. If we perceive the market as a dynamic process, then dynamic efficiency, understood as we know as coordination and creativity, results from the behavior of human beings who follow certain moral laws, mainly regarding the respect for life, private property, and the fulfillment of contracts. The exercise of human action subject to these ethical principles gives rise to a dynamically efficient social process. And it is now easy to see why, from a dynamic standpoint, efficient is not compatible. Efficiency is not compatible with different models of equity or justice. As the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics erroneously stated, for example, but instead, efficiency arises exclusively from one idea of justice, that based on the respect for private property and entrepreneurship. Therefore, the contradiction between efficiency and justice is plainly false. What is just cannot be inefficient, and what is efficient cannot be unjust. A dynamic analysis reveals that justice and efficiency are but the two sides of the same coin, which also confirms the consistent, integrated order that exists in the spontaneous order of human interactions. And now, truly, I finish. <laughs> our mind, our greatest cause for optimism about the future of the Austrian school as the main intellectual background for this new globalized world of the 21st century, based on entrepreneurship and creativity, is the growing number of young scholars, you, young, not so young, who in their uncompromising search for a scientific truth are abandoning the Keynesian, monetarist, and equilibrium models and theories of the already old mainstream, and embracing the Austrian School of Economics all over the world. For this reason, I would consider it in Germany, in Germany national interest to foster knowledge and research in the field of the Austrian School of Economics, so that at the country's great universities, this approach steadily, little by little, replaces the old Keynesian neoclassical monetarist, and I would say even, at least in some cases, all the liberal teachings, which are included like a pupurri in the university textbooks and syllabuses currently used 
most of them, what a pity, of American origin. Let us hope that this new tide soon also culminates its presence in this wonderful country of Germany. And if my books in German help even just a bit to accomplish this important task, I will consider that all my effort has been worthwhile. Thank you very much. <laughs>